While it's widely acknowledged that there's no single cause for serial crimes, common factors often emerge in the profiles of such offenders. Peter Curtin, known as a lust killer, is no exception. He was fundamentally a psychopath with an excessive sexual drive, a person so absorbed in himself that he disregarded the existence of others. Curtin confessed to experiencing a sense of tension before and after his crimes, a state that led experts to conclude that his motives were of a sexual nature. His violent acts were premeditated and executed to attain a form of sexual gratification that could only be achieved through violence. This represents the extreme manifestation of a grotesque and singular self-centeredness, fulfilling one's sexual desires regardless of the consequences. I perpetrated my arson attacks for the same reasons. A sadistic inclination. I derived pleasure from the blaze's glow and the cries for help. As for Curtin himself, he was a well-built man with a clean-shaven face and a healthy complexion. He was meticulous in all his personal habits, a trait that mirrored the self-obsession of his inner self. Curtin was deeply infatuated with himself, and his inability to extend this love to others was at the heart of his tragedy. During his examination, Curtin repeatedly referred to the hardships of his childhood and his time in prison. He often spoke of these experiences with intense resentment and frequently attributed them to his transformation into the person he became. Perhaps more than any other criminal of his kind, Curtin seemed to have a clear understanding of where, metaphorically speaking, it all went wrong. As George Godwin, an analyst of Curtin, once noted, If he did indeed become a tormentor of the innocent, it must be remembered that he started life as an innocent who was tormented. The question of his sanity, and therefore his legal accountability, inevitably became a significant aspect of the trial. It was determined that Curtin was not suffering from any organic or functional mental illness and was, therefore, legally responsible for his crimes. Psychoanalysts assert that a criminal differs from a person who adapts to society and that he fails to sublimate his aggressive primitive instincts. These actions are driven by the injuries caused by unfair treatment. It's undeniable that Curtin endured severe hardship in prison, which provided him with an easy rationalization for his actions later on. In his youthful naivety, Curtin would often tell himself, Just you wait, you bunch of villains. This sentiment was more or less a form of retaliation or revenge. For instance, he would take the life of an innocent person, someone who had no part in his mistreatment. But if there truly is such a thing as retributive justice on this earth, then his tormentors must feel it, even if they remain unaware of his deeds. In Curtin's case, this concept of retribution and redemption is deeply rooted in sadism and serves as a disguise for his sexual urges. Despite being studied by analysts in prison, these factors never seem to become the primary focus of the evaluation. A basic diagnosis of sadism in the patient while in prison could have saved many lives. But Curtin was instead free to view his crime as a justification for the brutality he had experienced throughout his life. He expressed regret for the innocent victims but never showed any remorse for his actions. Why should I? After all, I had a mission to fulfill. Curtin spent a considerable amount of time reflecting on himself and achieved a significant level of self-awareness. He was conscious of his deadly sadistic tendencies, but always attributed this to his genetics and upbringing. However, there were several instances when Curtin appeared to recognize his malevolent nature and almost apologized to a victim for his unnecessary actions. This is highly unusual for lust killers of Peter's type, who are typically entirely convinced by their motives for redemption. Interestingly, when considering all the psychopathic tendencies exhibited by Curtin, his propensity to lie and deceive was highly developed, and the facade of a respectable citizen was barely penetrable. His composed confidence allowed him to perfectly time his attacks and then swiftly disappear into the night. Yet, the most perplexing characteristic of Curtin is the immense loyalty he showed to his wife. For this murderer, the unfaithfulness of the assaults weighed more heavily than the bloody homicide. A puzzling character, Frau Curtin demonstrated great humility throughout her married life and viewed the difficult times with Peter as punishment for her past transgressions. As much as Curtin himself disrespected women, he seems to have understood this devotion and once remarked, My relationship with my wife was always good. I did not love her in a sensual way, but because of my admiration for her admirable character. Could it be that Curtin cherished his wife for her fixation on the idea of redemption, a sentiment he seemed unable to express? Perhaps if others had offered him more than mere physical satisfaction, a love that was selfless and humble,
Peter Curtin might not have become the person he did. However, this is all speculative. The origin of Curtin's sadistic tendencies will always remain a mystery, and we, as crime analysts, will never fully comprehend the truth. One can propose various genetic and emotional factors, yet still lack a persuasive explanation for the psychological enigma he represents. As Godwin once stated, love is the entrance to life, as hatred is the path to death. And it was Curtin's tragedy that he perished without realizing this timeless truth. Whatever the solution may be to the profound mystery that was Peter Curtin, it seems appropriate to conclude this analysis with the killer's own words. As I now reflect on the crimes I committed, they are so horrific that I do not wish to make any attempt to justify them. I am ready to face the repercussions of my wrongdoings and hope that in doing so, I will make amends for a significant part of what I have done. And when you contemplate my execution and acknowledge my sincere intention to atone for all my crimes, I would like to believe that the intense desire for revenge and animosity against me cannot persist. And I would like to request your forgiveness. Curtin had intended to execute one more dramatic assault before his apprehension, but his wife promptly alerted the police. When he encountered her again, as planned outside St. Rocus Church on May 24th, he was surrounded by police officers armed with handguns. Curtin openly admitted to his crimes and took perverse pleasure in recounting the gruesome details, causing discomfort among the police officers and stenographers present. He had replayed his crimes in his mind countless times and possessed an almost photographic memory, enabling him to recall minute details of Christine Klein's bedroom from 17 years prior. Curtin was put on trial in April 1931, where he initially retracted his confession and pleaded not guilty. However, under interrogation by the examining magistrate, he later changed his plea and was ultimately convicted of nine murders and sentenced to death. On the eve of his execution, he consumed a final meal of Wiener schnitzel, fried potatoes, and white wine, and made a remark to his psychiatrist about being able to hear the flow of his own blood. At 6 a.m. on July 2, 1931, despite objections from the German Humanitarian League, he was led to the guillotine and decapitated. The nightmare had finally come to an end.